Good evening, everyone. Hi. My name is Patty Manolis, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Geelong Regional Libraries. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to the Geelong Library and Heritage Centre this evening. To commence, I would like to acknowledge the Wadawurrung and Eastern Ma original owners of the lands on which our library services operate. We pay respects to Wadawurrung and Eastern Ma elders, past, present and emerging. We acknowledge and celebrate First Nations peoples of this land as the custodians of learning, literacy, knowledge and story. So tonight's event is an important occasion for Geelong Regional Libraries. Six years ago, our organisation lost a valued friend and colleague, Fiona Baranowski. Um, I wish to acknowledge Fiona's family who are here with us this evening, her husband Kim, um, and their children Grace, Darcy and Lucy, her sister and brother Michelle and Kia, her sister-in-law Jill, and nephews Jesse and Finn. We're also pleased that um, you and others that loved Fiona are able to join us tonight. Fiona passed away in March 2015 and we remember her as a vital contributing member of our team and miss her very much. She was an innovative and creative thinker and lectures such as the one that we're attending tonight um, with our esteemed guest, Ross Garno, who will deliver the lecture tonight, were just one of Fiona's innovations when she worked at a, as our literary events and projects coordinator. So she started the lecture series, it was called Open Mind Lecture Series back then. And to honour her immense contribution to libraries and communities, I'm very pleased to introduce tonight's event, Ross Garno Reset, as the fifth annual lecture in memory of Fiona. And the other um, thing I would like to say is it's really wonderful to see you in person. Uh, many of you will know that we weren't able to hold events like this for quite a long time. So it's wonderful to be able to see the Baranowski family in the flesh again. We weren't able to um, 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 deliver this lecture last year. And of course, all of you in person and may that continue. <laughs> and now I'd like to turn to introducing to our guest speaker. Economist Ross Garno. Ross is the Professorial Research Fellow in Economics at the University of Melbourne. In 2008, he produced the Garno Climate Change Review for the Australian Government. He is the author of many books, including the best selling Dog Days, Australia After the Boom, and Superpower. Ross's book, Reset, Restoring Australia After the Pandemic Recession shows how the COVID-19 crisis offers Australia the opportunity to reset its economy and build a successful future and why the old approaches will not work. So without further ado, could you please join me in warmly welcoming Ross to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Patty, and uh, I'm very pleased to to be here uh, giving a lecture in honour of, of Fiona, who uh, uh, I've, I've learned uh, uh, was a wonderful member of this community, uh, dedicating her life to good causes, um, uh, including the, the cause of the role of knowledge in good policy making. Uh, a, a, a good, a good uh, a commitment for a librarian. Uh, li the libraries are, are uh, repositories of knowledge, uh, never uh, more in need than at the present, when uh, when the role of real knowledge is is challenged, as it hasn't been challenged for a long time. Uh, in my book, uh, Reset, uh, uh, Restoring Australia After the Pandemic Recession, the first chapter is called The Tree of Knowledge. Uh, it's about uh, the, the, the role of, of knowledge, of public education, uh, in uh, uh, good public policy in a democracy. Uh, and in that chapter, I, I talk about how uh, it's always been a distinctive feature of our democracy in Australia 
uh, that uh, uh, the search for knowledge has, has been at the center of good policy. And that's uh, a, a search that uh, was a very important part of Fiona's life um, and a, a lot of her special commitments uh, to, to the environment, to social justice, uh, in, involved the application of, of knowledge of public education to finding better ways of dealing with those questions. The, um, in preparing this book, well, the book's based on uh, six public lectures I gave from the small town, village really, of Buck Alden in the very middle of Queensland, the, the central west of Queensland, where Jane, uh, with me this evening, uh, my wife and I uh, uh, decided to spend COVID uh, there, there rather than in lockdown in Melbourne. Uh, and. Uh, Bark Alden is the home of the tree of knowledge. Um, and, and those of you who follow Australian history will know about the great strike of 1891, uh, when after the defeat of the, the strike, uh, the workers, mostly shearers, uh, met under the tree of knowledge to decide what they would do next. And uh, what they decided to do was first to share knowledge well, they said they were meeting under the tree of knowledge. They called that tree the tree of knowledge um, uh, to, uh, to, to find ways of, of finding a way out of their predicament uh, that didn't involve um, uh, violence. And uh, uh, that led to the formation of the Australian Labor Party, uh, vigorous first in Queensland. And... Uh, uh, I note in the book that it's a triumph of our history that a decisive time is marked by a tree of knowledge and not like a great battle, like the Battle of Yorktown, which made Washington a great figure, and, or the Battle of Gettysburg, which made Lincoln a great figure. It's a triumph of our democracy. That, uh, it's a symbol of knowledge that uh, marks a decisive time. In chapter one of the, of the book, uh, I talk about the problem of the downgrading of knowledge in, in recent years in the Western democracies. Um, uh, there have been a number of causes of that. Uh, one has been the increased role of, uh, of money in politics, which uh, uh, has been very effective in distorting the, the public discussion of big policy issues so that uh, uh, democratic uh, application of knowledge is not effective in coming up with real solutions to problems. And uh, that uh, the problem has been made more difficult by the internet. Uh, I talk about that in the book, talk about uh, an expression that uh, I first heard used by Malcolm Turnbull, that. Um, uh, the, the internet has allowed narrow casting of knowledge of, uh, uh, in the old days, a uh, newspaper to, to, to be commercially successful had to appeal to all the people in the community because you had to sell papers to everyone and, and uh, it developed a, a strong readership by having a reputation for, for, for being reliable in the uh, conveying of knowledge. But, but with the internet, uh, you can build an audience just by aiming uh, at one part of the community. Uh, you don't need the uh, broadly based support that, that's needed for a, a newspaper to carry all the overhead costs of uh, manufacturing a newspaper. It's quite cheap to just uh, put, put stuff on the internet. So you can focus on a narrow part of the community and you end up breaking down the public discussion into a lot of uh, uh, smaller discussions amongst people who all think the same things uh, and are not don't have open minds to uh, to, to uh, absorption of new information and not challenged by new information. Understand that a favourite phrase of Fiona's was uh, uh, the open mind. Uh, uh, well, the internet, unfortunately, has been instrumental in closing a lot of minds and leading to a lot of partisan commitment to uh, a conflicting opinion. 
and the downgrading of the role of knowledge. Uh, and this has been especially important in the English-speaking countries in the United States, Britain, and here. Uh, um, it uh, went furthest of all in the United States with the election of a president, President Trump, who uh, did not seem to think there was any objective knowledge at all. Uh, and uh, uh, that, that turned out to be very unfortunate for the United States. It was bound to be unfortunate anyway. Uh, it was going to lead to very large problems anyway. But when the pandemic hit, uh, the countries that did well were the countries that took scientific knowledge seriously and acted on it early on. And the countries that did badly had leaders who denied the importance of knowledge. Uh, two most prominent leaders who denied knowledge were uh, the presidents of the United States and Brazil. And they ended up two of the, the two countries with the largest numbers so far of deaths from uh, the pandemic. Well over half a million dead in the United States, more than uh, in all the foreign wars of the US put together, right back to the War of Independence. Uh, Add to that the, uh, the First and Second World War, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Iraq War, Afghanistan, well, COVID has killed more than all of those put together. Uh, a very severe situation in Brazil uh, as well. Uh, difficult in the United Kingdom and Europe. Uh, the countries that have done better are mostly in our part of the world, in, in the Western Pacific Hemisphere. Um, uh, and uh, we're, we're fortunate to be one of these. And uh, uh, the, all of these countries uh, have in, in common that uh, their, their governments did take uh, medical knowledge seriously from the beginning and acted quite strongly to use the powers of government to, to uh, close off transmission, to encourage uh, uh, behavior that uh, limited transmission. And so the uh, distinctively the best performers are those in countries in our region, um, possibly very best of all, uh, the island of uh, Taiwan, uh, uh, with about as many people as Australia, about 25 million, uh, but, but also uh, Korea and Japan uh, and uh, uh, the People's Republic of China, uh, Vietnam, Thailand, uh, Australia and New Zealand. Um, these were the best performers I in the world. They, amongst the things they had in common was uh, uh, a, a willingness to uh, use scientific knowledge in public policy, and secondly, to, to, well, secondly, they had quite good public health systems to begin with, and, uh, and thirdly, a preparedness to use those public health systems strongly. Uh, we were certainly fortunate that our governments, federal and state, taken together, uh, were amongst the countries that took knowledge seriously at an early stage. Um, we might have even been a bit lucky because on some other questions, we haven't taken knowledge so seriously. And uh, 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 climate change is one of those where we are with the United States as countries which for a long time didn't take um, uh, scientific knowledge seriously. Climate change an issue uh, that was very important to uh, to, to Fiona. Um, uh, one effect of the pandemic uh, uh, and the better performance of countries that took knowledge seriously uh, uh, has been to increase, I think, respect for scientific knowledge. And I'm hopeful that uh, in Australia and in other countries that. Uh, the reward we've had from taking medical science seriously will be followed by greater uh, use of real knowledge, scientific knowledge in other spheres, including climate policy and uh, economic policy. Uh, would you, uh, my book, uh, after that discussion of the role of knowledge, uh, uh, tell, tells the story of how the pandemic came. Uh, pandemics are not all that unusual in world history. In fact, the world has been, human civilization has been shaped by them. Uh, periodically, plagues of various kinds decimated uh, human population. Um, but uh, they have not been so uh, 
severe uh, in modern times as earlier in our history. Um, and, uh, but, we, but over the last uh, couple of decades in the 21st century, there were precursors to this particular uh, pandemic, uh, the coronaviruses of different kinds, uh, SARS and MERS uh, 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 struck parts of the world, had quite a severe effect, but, but nowhere near as severe as this one. Uh, partly in response to those shocks from those other coronaviruses, a, a lot of countries put in place measures to, uh, to deal with such emergencies. And uh, the countries that ended up doing quite well out of uh, in, in managing the virus, including our own, had, had in place uh, approaches to uh, dealing with the pandemic should one come. The United States had also put in place quite strong measures. So the two previous presidents had put in place quite uh, strong measures, but they were partly dismantled by President Trump. And uh, and then those those parts of the response that weren't dismantled uh, weren't acted on when the the virus hit. But historically, pandemics are not unusual. Uh, we've been reminded early in the 21st century that they're, they're still around. Uh, and uh, uh, we should all be aware that, that uh, they will come again. Uh, when the pandemic started to uh, uh, thrust itself into Australia and there was talk of shutdowns at Melbourne University, I've got, I've got quite good friends in the Doherty Institute and the medical uh, faculty and uh, um, and it became clear that this was going to be a very difficult winter of 2020, and that's when Jane and I took the decision to to uh, take ourselves to the warmth and natural social distancing of uh, the west of Queensland. Doing that, I felt a little bit under peer pressure because uh, that's what William Shakespeare did in the Great Plague of 1605. He went back to his small village of Stratford-on-Avon and uh, wrote Antony and Cleopatra and Macbeth and a dozen of the sonnets. So uh, uh, I, I thought I couldn't simply uh, sit down in Barcold and do nothing. And uh, Isaac Newton, uh, the founder of modern economics and mathematics through the calculus uh, uh, had been a, a, a teenager at Cambridge University when the Great Plague of 1665 hit. He took himself back to Cambridge, which was Cam where Cambridge University is, just a village in those days, and, uh, and within the year in which he was uh, escaping from plague, I wrote uh, Principia Mathematica, which is the basis of modern physics and modern mathematics. So um, uh, my contribution is a very humble one, uh, but uh, it's, uh, it, it's my uh, contribution from the plague of uh, 2020. Um, uh, uh, early in the pandemic, our Prime Minister said what we've got to do is just hold things for a while uh, and then snap back to what we have before. I've got a chapter in the book early on called Wrong Way, Don't Go Back, uh, uh, because things weren't very good in uh, the years immediately before the pandemic. Um, uh, I wrote a book called Dog Days, Australia After the Boom in 2013, saying that if we didn't change some of the ways we were, we were doing things, we faced a, a future of stagnating incomes for ordinary people and uh, persistently, unacceptably high unemployment and uh, circumstances that would cause our community to be pretty unhappy about how things were going. Well. And that's why I called the book Dog Days. It was a warning about what would happen if we didn't do something. Well, we didn't do something, and we lived through the dog days. And uh, uh, the, the, those years, on average, had no increase in average economic output per person in Australia. We, we were the worst performers of the developed world. We're much lower than the average of other developed countries, very much lower than the United States. 
um, and lower even than Japan, which a lot of Australians come to think of as, in, at least in economic growth terms, a bit of a basket case. Well, if Japan was, was a basket case, uh, we were outperformed by Japan. Um, I, incidentally, I don't think Japan is a basket case, but uh, that, that is a common perception of the uh, Japanese economy at the moment. Um, during that, that um, seven years, uh, unemployment didn't fall at all. It were, we were five point something uh, in 2013 and five point something last year, when, this time last year when the pandemic struck. That contrasts, for example, with the United States where unemployment started several percent higher than Australia at the beginning of the period, 2013, and ended up 3.5 percent. So we stayed like that in the United States, uh, came down like that. And that's not because there's anything inherent in the American economy that made that better. I think we made some big mistakes of economic policy. And I discussed that at some length. Uh, uh, I've been fairly critical of uh, the Reserve Bank. I said that on average, uh, there were 300,000 more people unemployed in Australia during that time than needed to be. Uh, and I call this 300 people voluntary unemployment, voluntary in the sense that uh, it's uh, unemployment that the Reserve Bank choose to, chose to have. Um, uh, some of my friends in the Reserve Bank have defended themselves rather strongly in yesterday's financial review. A friend of mine, former deputy governor of the Reserve Bank, wrote an article on the opinion pages saying it wasn't their fault, it was actually government austerity that caused all that unemployment. Uh, 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 well, what I say in the book is that uh, 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 given that we made those mistakes in monetary policy, the Reserve Bank's policy, then the government should have had a different policy, but the primary error was that of the Reserve Bank. Well, the, the Reserve Bank strongly resisted that critique, but I did notice that yesterday the Reserve Bank governor made a statement saying that what we're aiming for is unemployment uh, to uh, be much lower than it had been before, and maybe it will be a number beginning with a three. Well, that, that is what I'd said in the book. I, I'm sh uh, there's no need for the Reserve Bank to say it was wrong. Uh, what, what is important is that they're acting as if they know that it was wrong and are going to do something different. So uh, uh, I'm hopeful that aiming for genuine full employment, the sort of full employment that people of my age and some others of my age in the audience uh, grew up with, um, unemployment with it, a number with a two or three per, uh, in front of the percentage uh, rather than the high rates that we came to accept as normal. But for all those reasons, we don't want to just snap back to where we were. But I say that it wouldn't be possible to go back to where we were anyway. We, we'll have a trillion dollars more public debt uh, the federal and the states put together. Business investment was very low in the period uh, just before the dog days, especially investment in export industries. Um, the recession, the, the big shock that came last year will mean that a lot of people, young people's skills uh, will be degraded because they weren't able to, to get quickly into employment using the skills that they learnt, and that means that skills weaken. So even if we wanted to, uh, if we adopted the same policies as we had before the pandemic, uh, we wouldn't get as good an outcome as we got before the uh, pandemic. But uh, we shouldn't be satisfied with that anyway. We can do much better than that. And what we should be aiming at is genuine full employment. And that's the lowest level of employment that you can have without uh, um, uh, the, uh, without such strong inflationary pressures that inflation gets high and starts to accelerate. And the fir when you, you know you're getting near full employment, when real wages start rising in the marketplace, well, we haven't had that situation for a very long time. And uh, I talk about how we get back to that situation. Um, if uh, if full employment is going to be sustainable and to be associated with rising incomes of ordinary people, 
uh, as it was not in the dog days, then, um, th then we've got to make sure that uh, we don't get all of the growth in employment just from government spending, the sort of things we've had in the last year, but get uh, a reasonable uh, proportion of it uh, from uh, uh, investment and uh, and uh, um, and uh, expanding output in the trade exposed industries, especially the export industries. How do we get that? Uh, well, first of all, uh, the things I've already been talking about, getting the right balance between Reserve Bank policy and Treasury policy, between monetary policy and fiscal policy, but I also make a suggestion for changing the basis of our corporate income tax, not a tax cut, n no change in the rate, but just a change in which, in the way in which we calculate it so that uh, those who uh, are investing heavily, are innovating, taking risks, pay less tax, and uh, those who are just sitting on their laurels earning rents from past investments uh, pay more tax, and, and the reform that I suggest um, would, would have those beneficial effects. Uh, I note in, in the, uh, early in the book in the discussion of, uh, 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 of knowledge that uh, the times we've done well in Australian economic policy have been times when we've placed a lot of emphasis on social justice, on uh, uh, equity and in income distribution. Uh, and uh, 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 that's when you get strong community support for change, uh, change to improve uh, economic performance. I, I mentioned that, that uh, the most successful periods, the period of post-war reconstruction, uh, the, the policies that, that emerged uh, from the Second World War, and, and then the reform period from 1983 under the Hawke government, where, where there, was a, there, there was a lot of uh, disruptive economic reform to raise productivity, but at the same time a strong focus on measures to increase social justice. That was a period when when uh, Medicare was reintroduced. It had been introduced first by the Whitlam government, only last for a year before it was abolished by the Fraser government. Uh, the Whitlam, the uh, Hawke government brought it back. Uh, the, the family allowances for, for children. Huge uh, expansion of uh, education uh, um, availability for high school kids and, uh, uh, and un university students. and. Uh, uh, all, all of those measures uh, made it possible for Australians to accept the change that was necessary to give us better economic performance. And so I'm saying, well, if we're going to do well now, uh, we'll have to uh, put a lot of emphasis on equity as well as on economic policy to, uh, to, to give us stronger growth in the economy uh, with moderate amount of, of, of debt. And, and uh, this reform that I suggest that would do most to contribute to equitable income distribution would be the integration of the tax and social security systems uh, around the idea of a minimum basic income. Um, I, I won't go into a lot of details here, but, but the basic idea is that the most Australians, all except those with high incomes and high wealth, uh, would receive into their uh, at their bank accounts uh, every fortnight a minimum basic payment equal to the unemployment benefit, then they'd be taxed on their first, uh, we'd be taxed on the first, from the first dollar of income at a moderate rate. You wouldn't get the sudden withdrawal of uh, most of the social security payment uh, as incomes reached above a certain level, which happens now, which is a very big disincentive for uh, people on social security of various kinds. Um, to uh, enter full-time employment. And uh, I, I suggest that if we do that, we'll get much better economic performance out of it, but it also uh, will, will be an augmentation of low incomes uh, for, for people uh, at, the, uh, at the bottom of the income distribution who've got relatively low incomes and, and uh, are only working part-time. It would be especially beneficial for, for some of the people who've been hurt most by the pandemic recession. Uh, we know from the statistics that are coming out that it's, it's young people, especially, and uh, more, especially women, that have been hurt most by the pandemic recession, and they, 
uh, would be the biggest beneficiaries of this particular reform. If we're going to have growth in incomes and sustainable uh, growth in incomes alongside full employment as we come out of the pandemic recession, we do need quite strong growth in our export industries. Uh, we can't rely simply on expanded government expenditure. We've done well in the last year uh, because the, the government did spend a lot of borrowed money on JobKeeper and JobSeeker and other emergency programs. That was the right thing to do and it stopped unemployment falling, uh, employment falling, unemployment increasing t to very high levels. But but we have to see that as emergency measures and the focus has to be on, on uh, uh, get, getting employment growth through other mechanisms uh, in, in future from now on. And one of the ways that uh, that can, uh, part of the contribution to growth has to be in the export industries uh, or, it's not, or the growth is not going to be sustainable. And uh, I note in chapter 11 of the book that uh, there's quite a few challenges for our export industries at the moment. Uh, uh, the rest of the world is strongly committed to uh, dealing with the problem of climate change, even if we're not, and 22% uh, of our exports are coal and gas. Well, coal exports won't be, coal exports will be falling, gas won't be increasing, and after, a, period, gas will be falling as well. So that's quite a big headwind against export growth. Another big headwind is that uh, the most dynamic of our export industries in the period before uh, the, the pandemic, it, through the dog days, were the, uh, the, the education industry and the tourist industry, where, which rely on international travel. Well, that's stopped dead for the moment. Uh, uh, in, uh, international students and uh, uh, and uh, international tourists, and it won't come back quickly. And uh, uh, I, I say that uh, one of the reasons it won't come back quickly in the case of education is that we've al we've allowed the pandemic to do great damage to the universities. So all of our service industries that had uh, a lot of reliance on international travel were greatly damaged by the pandemic. And I compare the universities with another big service industry, not as big, but uh, relies a lot on foreign tourists and uh, the casino industry. Well, uh, Crown Casino got $115 million of JobKeeper uh, in the four months after the recession, kept on getting a lot more after that. Uh, University of Melbourne, Monash University, Deakin, uh, all of the other 31 universities of Australia together got nothing. Uh, uh, and uh, there, there were similar reductions in revenue, uh, but they got nothing. Now, I say in the book, I hope this was an accident, and if it's an accident, it can be corrected. If it's not corrected, then one of our most dynamic export industries, the education industry, uh, uh, will, will not be making the contribution in future even when international travel is restored. So that's, a, that, that's an, a second big headwind. And a third big headwind at the moment is the problems in our relations with China. China's been our most dynamic uh, export market. Uh, China absorbs, as in the year before the pandemic, as much of our exports as the next nine countries added together. Um, if you include Hong Kong in the China column and not the rest of the world column, it, uh, China absorbs as much as the next 11 countries uh, put together. Um, and uh, uh, complicated reasons why our relations with China have deteriorated, but we just have to accept that, that uh, uh, while relations are in this state, it's quite a big headwind against uh, export growth. Uh, well, all of that would would suggest it's going to be very difficult for us to uh, get the export growth that's necessary to make full employment and rising income sustainable. Uh, that would be true except for one thing, and it's one thing that can make all the difference. And uh, I wish uh, uh, Fiona, uh, with her particular interest in, um, uh, in sustainability and, uh, uh, and the environment in climate change, were here to see it. Um, uh, one consequence of the pandemic, and a surprising one uh, to me, 
uh, is that uh, we've emerged from it with uh, the world being much more committed to action on climate change than before. Uh, and uh, uh, we're in a situation now, we weren't in this situation a year ago, in which every developed country other than Australia is committed to zero em emissions by uh, 2050. Um, uh, the United Kingdom and, and the European Union and the smaller countries of Europe that are not members of the EU have had that position for some time. Uh, but in the last year, Japan and Korea, the, the, the two other big developed countries of our region, have had that commitment. Uh, New Zealand and Canada have got it. Now, they didn't have it some time ago. Uh, and uh, as a result of the election in the United States, uh, the United States, is, under President Biden, is committed to zero emissions from electricity by 2035. I mean, we're a bit worried that uh, one of our many coal power stations will close in 28. Well, uh, Biden's saying there won't be any coal or any gas generating power by 2035, not, not, not that long after the closure of the first of the remaining ones of ours. Uh, and President Biden has not only said that, he said we'll have zero net emissions by 2050, so that's now every developed country, uh, and uh, we're going to make sure the rest of the world has zero emissions by 2050. Now, some countries might not take much notice of the United States President saying that, but, but it's rather hard for Australia not to take notice, especially at a time when there's some tensions in relations with China. So. Uh, the, the geopolitical environment for uh, climate change policy has changed radically. During this same period, our biggest trading partner, China, entered a commitment um, last September uh, to zero uh, net emissions by 2060. China considers itself a developing country and developing countries under the UN agreements are not obliged to reach zero emissions as early as others. Well, long before 2050, China will have average incomes like developed countries, so I think they'll have to get in with the other developed countries on zero by 2050. But anyway, zero by, 2050, by 2060 is a very big commitment by China. Uh, the, China is by far the biggest emitter now of greenhouse gases in the world, about 28%. America second, 15%. Um, China uh, making that commitment is a big deal. Well, this act, this will mean that we won't be exporting gas and coal in the middle of the century, and we have to adjust to that. But the bigger news for Australia is that it opens up huge new opportunities. Um, th this was the subject of uh, an earlier book of mine, Superpower, Australia's Low Carbon Opportunity, which I published at the end of 2019. But the, the, in that book, and, and I've got a couple of chapters in this book uh, updating that, uh, I, I explain how when the whole world is uh, committed to zero emissions, uh, as Australia has very big economic advantages in that world. And the, the advantages come from two sources. One is we have the, by far the richest uh, um, resources for renewable energy in, in the developed world, uh, combinations of wind and solar. Uh, the, the combinations of excellent solar, excellent wind that we have in parts of Australia, in a lot of Australia, are, are unusual on a world scale. So that if we embrace the opportunity, make the most of it, then um, we'll, uh, we'll have the lowest cost energy in the world. Uh, and uh, that creates a very big advantage for Australian industry. Uh, it's not only advantage, an advantage for our standard of living, uh, the, the, the cost of energy that we use will fall, but a very big advantage for our industry. For example, in the zero emissions world economy, we won't be making uh, iron, metal, and steel out of coal. We'll have to make it out of hydrogen made from renewable energy. That's the way you can turn iron ore into iron metal with zero emissions. Well, Australia is by far the biggest producer of iron ore in the world. Uh, we supply about 40% of the world's iron ore. Uh, we supply more than 60% last year, about 70% of China's uh, imports of iron ore, and uh, China 
accounts for half of the world's production of steel. Uh, and uh, China will not be producing uh, uh, steel out of coal in the zero emissions economy. Uh, the, the natural way to uh, turn iron ore into uh, iron metal will be by uh, uh, using hydrogen made from renewable energy to pl play the role that coal does now. Um, uh, now, this is a big deal on a global scale. Uh, Australian total greenhouse gas emissions, a bit more than one, a little bit more than one percent of world emissions. Uh, the uh, uh, emissions from uh, turning iron ore into iron metal are, are more than seven percent of uh, world emissions. About probably about three percent of world emissions are turning Australian iron ore into. Uh, into iron metal. It's going to be much cheaper to do that in Australia than in other countries. This is, we also have the world's best coal for turning uh, iron ore into uh, steel, but the difference between uh, uh, um, uh, coal and hydrogen is that our big advantages in coal are not an, uh, an advantage for Australian industry because we export the coal and it's about the same price in Kobe in Japan or uh, Shanghai in China as it is in the uh, steel making centres of Australia. In fact, it's cheaper to ship, ship uh, Queensland metallurgical coal uh, to uh, Korea or Japan or China than it is around to Wyala, to the blast furnaces in uh, South Australia. Uh, it won't be like that with renewable energy. It's very expensive to uh, build a transmission line to take the excellent uh, low cost uh, a renewable electricity from Australia uh, to Asia. In fact, the cost in Asia will be more than twice as high uh, as it is in Australia, much more than twice as high. Uh, you, you could uh, turn the uh, renewable energy into hydrogen, export the hydrogen and use the hydrogen in other countries, but uh, uh, a couple of younger people uh, here who will be learning in their high school physics that uh, um, uh, that, that it takes an aw awful amount of uh, energy to uh, uh, re reduce uh, temperatures to absolute zero or near absolute zero. And hydrogen doesn't turn into a liquid until you get very close to absolute zero. You use half the energy in hydrogen just to get it there. It's also very expensive to move hydrogen from one country to another because uh, even once it's in a liquid form because uh, hydrogen is the smallest molecule. Uh, you know that from your high school uh, physics and so it seeps out between the uh, molecules of steel uh, in the side of a ship. So you have to have special materials that makes it more expensive. So uh, it's going to be very much cheaper to use Australian renewable energy in Australia uh, for making not only iron but uh, aluminium uh, or silicon. Silicon uh, has uh, three raw materials. Uh, um, one is sand or quartz, and we've got a fair bit of that in Australia. Uh, the, the other is renewable energy, uh, or energy, and in the zero emissions world, will be renewable energy. The, the, the third is it needs uh, a lot of carbon. That's got to be zero emissions carbon, and we've got a lot of opportunities for growing biomass uh, for producing zero emissions carbon in Australia. So this, this is a great opportunity for Australia. I, if we embrace the change, uh, make the most of it, uh, our products are the uh, have a natural place in the change that will occur in the rest of the world as they go towards zero emissions. A second big advantage and very important in this region, uh, in Victoria, west of Melbourne, um, and that is our advantages in storing carbon in the landscape. Th this is a big deal. Uh, 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 it's actually using a technology that's that's been proven f for several billion years, uh, uh, photosynthesis, uh, algae or plants uh, absorbing uh, sunlight and, uh, and energy from the sun and carbon dioxide from the air and converting it into carbon in a, in a plant. Now, uh, over hundreds of millions of years, some of that uh, was deposited in the earth, earth and turned into oil or coal or uh, uh, or a, a gas, and, and that's the raw material, a hydrocarbon or a carbon uh, that we use in a wide range of chemical manufacturers in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, plastics, all plastics 
at the moment come from that uh, and other sources, but, but you can uh, bypass the, a few hundred million years and use the uh, biomass directly uh, as a raw material for chemical uh, manufacturers, for plastics and so on. Um, but also, uh, as the plant grows, it absorbs a lot of uh, carbon into the, into the plant, uh, and uh, a part of the growth of the plant involves uh, uh, um, growth of roots and depositing of carbon in the soils. If we manage our landscape well, we can get big increases in the carbon in the soil and plants, and also biomass uh, for industry. And we can do that, just like uh, we've got a big advantage in renewable energy, we've got a big advantage in in these landscape captures of carbon uh, because we've got far more woodland uh, uh, than per person, and that's what matters economically, how much per person than any other uh, developed country, and the developed countries have far more per person than the developing countries. So this is potentially a, a huge advantage. Uh, we, we can be a big exporter of uh, carbon credits to countries that are having more difficulty uh, reducing their own emissions, but also uh, of industrial products that, that use uh, biomass uh, uh, grown uh, in Australia um, uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, a wide range of industrial uses. So uh, the book concludes by talking about the choice we have. Uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can close our eyes to the sign I put up, uh, wrong way, don't go back. Uh, and, uh, and and go back and uh, and go back to the to the dog days of stagnant incomes, uh, uh, unacceptably high unemployment, uh, or we can embrace the, uh, uh, the the new opportunities that have been expanded by uh, political change in the United States during the pandemic, partly as a result of the pandemic, uh, the election of President Biden, uh, and. Uh, uh, by embracing restoration of Australia uh, can uh, achieve genuine full employment with rising incomes and a just distribution of income in Australia. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. We'll now move to the Q&A section of this evening. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and we'll come round to you. Thank you. I was asking, you mentioned the university system and the need to bring back the overseas students. Wouldn't it also be a time for a reset by which the university system seemed to have either voluntarily or under government pressure been forced to rely too heavily on overseas students and at the expense of Australian students. And in terms of, I mean, there's lots of anecdotal stories of pressure on lecturers at universities to not to fail any overseas students and try to keep the money coming in. Um, isn't it a time for a reset where the education system, tertiary education system, should focus on Australian students rather than, um, and have the overseas students as an additional and much, um, much wanted extra, rather than trying to gear the entire education system towards overseas students, which would probably seem to have been the case beforehand. Yes, I, I think that success of Australian governments over modern times have uh, uh, cut back excessively on uh, funding for domestic students and res research, and that uh, th that has meant that universities have only been able to uh, maintain high, st uh, high standards, high rankings uh, internationally by uh, uh, heavy reliance on foreign students. I don't think the uh, uh, reliance on a lot of foreign students need be a bad thing. It depends a lot on how an institution is managed. Um, Australia has two world-class economics graduate programs uh, you, you need a lot of very clever students to have a world-class graduate program uh, the, 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 with apologies for people from other universities present, but I think the, the world-class ones are at ANU and Melbourne, and uh, uh, we wouldn't have the enough uh, top students in economics to run world-class graduate students without uh, graduate programs without the 
uh, uh, foreign students, uh, and it would be necessary for Australians to go to to Harvard or Oxford or uh, somewhere else to get a first class, first class graduate uh, degree. So uh, it's, it's not all bad. Universities that really focus on excellence can use the availability of foreign students and the revenue associated with, with that to actually strengthen uh, education for Australians. But there are a lot of institutions that haven't done that. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I think that part of the, the resetting, yes, I, I'm very critical of the way we haven't funded our universities adequately. It will be worse after the pandemic because we don't have that revenue. And so far, there's been no increase in other revenue. Uh, in fact, rather the opposite. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I, it's, it's clear from uh, uh, what I say in the book that there'll be, uh, that there's actually necessary to, to do things to strengthen our universities, to make the most of the opportunities ahead, and that will require uh, more domestic funding uh, as, as well as it requires uh, uh, welcoming uh, for foreign students, but maintaining high standards and not accepting uh, categories of students that uh, will only come I if we lower our standards. Thanks very much, Ross, for your talk. I'd like to raise the principle of economic growth. For those of us in the sustainability movement, it, it always seems something of a conundrum. How can you have continuous economic growth in a finite world? But I'd really appreciate your thoughts on the matter. Yeah, it depends a bit on what we mean by economic growth. By economic growth, I mean, I mean rising standards of living. Uh, and, you can, and you can have li r r rising standards of living and qualities of services without increased pressure on the environment. It depends on the content of growth. Uh, 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 an illustration I sometimes use to make the point is so uh, when I first went to Japan, did a lot of, lot of uh, economic research on Japan from 1969 uh, in the early 70s, and uh, the environment was horrific in Japan. Uh, there wasn't a living creature in, in uh, Tokyo Harbor. Uh, you, you could never see uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the beautiful Mount Fuji from, uh, uh, from anywhere in, in the metropolitan area of Tokyo because of smog. Um, well, today, uh, lots of fish in Tokyo Harbor, and, uh, uh, and you can, on a, if there's no cloud, you can see uh, uh, Mount Fuji clearly from uh, Kunitachi, uh, and yet Japanese are much richer today than they were then because they grew through technological improvement in doing things in, in a different way. Now, it doesn't happen by accident. It required real policy to do that. They put a whole lot of restrictions on the use of, uh, uh, of fossil energy. Um, uh, as a result, Japan went in in the 1970s, Japan was the biggest producer of aluminium in the world. Uh, by the end of, about one and a half decades later, Japan produced no aluminium because they had to burn coal or oil to, um, to get the electricity to do it. And, and they uh, imported their requirements from coal-based uh, aluminium made in Australia. Uh, now, the, the environmental damage of burning coal in Australia is much less than in densely populated Japan. Uh, but uh, but we can do what Japan did and change uh, our, uh, 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 our uh, aluminium industry uh, not by getting rid of it, by converting it from coal base to a renewable energy base. In today's world, and I've done a lot of work on this, that, that will actually be cheaper. It's more likely that Portland aluminium smelter and Newcastle and Gladstone will survive if they shift to uh, renewable energy. In fact, they can survive and flourish and expand if they make that shift, but uh, they won't survive if uh, they don't make the, the shift. So uh, similarly, uh, uh, one can use the example of uh, uh, improvements in living standards that uh, uh, are the result of doing things better uh, without using more resources. For example, uh, uh, medical services are very much better today 
than 50 years ago. That's a big improvement in the standard of living. That's economic growth. Uh, uh, and that economic growth has occurred without any increased pressure on the environment. Uh, so what we've got to do is break the nexus between uh, the, the standard of living of people and, uh, uh, and the pressure on the environment. Um, the, the, the carbon price we had for a while was one way of doing that. Uh, uh, and that was doing a good job of, of, of that, but we got rid of that. Uh, um, maybe we can go back to it one day, but uh, there's a lot of history there that we'll, we'll, we'll uh, have to overcome. But let's, uh, let, let's not denigrate uh, economic growth uh, as rising, let's not denigrate rising living standards. We can have higher living standards if we get it from technological improvement uh, in a way that sets out to avoid and to reduce pressures on the environment, and we can. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, in that, how important is limiting population growth globally? Um, I'm, I'm just, I can't understand that um, if our population continues to grow at the rate it is, that we won't destroy our planet just through the simple fact of having so many people? Yeah, I, I think that uh, uh, population growth does increase the challenge of pressure on the environment, no doubt about that. Um, and uh, uh, now w we can uh, uh, provide all the people who are currently alive on Earth with uh, a, a reasonable living standard, a good living standard, in, without pressure on the environment if we do things in a different way, but it's the more people, the harder it is to do that. Uh, and uh, if population growth increased without limit, then we would come to a point where we could no longer do that. Although, although some of the important innovations that are going on now in, for example, food technology um, uh, may reduce the pressures quite a lot. Uh, uh, a, a lot of the pressure from food consumption on the environment comes from our eating cows and sheep where you, you need, for cattle, you need about seven or eight uh, kilograms of grain to produce a kilogram of, uh, of meat. Uh, there are technologies available now that produce a food that looks and tastes and smells like meat but made from uh, grain or other biomass and only uses a kilogram of uh, a grain for a kilogram of meat, so so that can improve that trade-off. But uh, but but I think it's uh, undoubtedly true that we, we we need a human population to to stabilise, to stop growing uh, 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 so sooner rather than later. If if uh, we're easily going to manage, comfortably going to manage uh, all of the pressures on the environment. Uh, the the good news is that uh, there's no case. In, in the world uh, for countries enjoying reasonably high living standards where fertility hasn't fallen below replacement levels. Um, uh, fertility fell a lot, uh, fertility, the average numbers of births per woman of uh, childbearing age uh, fell to the lowest level ever in Australia last year, uh, down around one and a half bit below. Uh, you need 2.1 kids per woman of childbearing age to uh, to maintain population because uh, because of slight imbalances in the sex ratios at birth and also uh, uh, a proportion of women who don't survive to, uh, uh, to uh, through the through the childbearing years. Uh, so 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 you need a bit more than two per, per woman to stabilise population, well, we're way below two. China's down to about 1.2. Uh, so if your fertility's down at that level, uh, no, Japan is 1.2, China a little bit higher, but uh, at Japan's level, 1.2 uh, and falling, uh, then uh, you get a 40% reduction in population every generation. Uh, 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 and uh, that, there's no developed country now with uh, fertility levels uh, above replacement levels. And in the developing world, uh, as living standards rise, uh, uh, fertility falls. Uh, in India, I first take, 
scientists are taking interest in these matters of population in India at the time of the 1971 census, and then the average woman had 7.1 kids uh, through th those years. But the ratio fell by about one child every decade. Of, uh, they have Indian censuses every decade, every 10 years, and, and, uh, and the most recent, uh, they're due for another one uh, this year. I'll we'll watch it with great interest. It was 2.3 last time, just above replacement levels, almost down to the level. Uh, 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 in the world, and even, and it doesn't really matter very much uh, whether you're getting your uh, advice on uh, sexual behavior from the Pope or uh, an imam in a Muslim community. Uh, these ratios behave in a similar way. Italy and Spain, Catholic countries, have amongst the lowest fertility rates in the world, uh, uh, way down near Japan's. Uh, and uh, in, in, the, in the Islamic world, uh, countries that had periods of rising living standards, like Iran did for a long time, fertility has fallen very much as in other places, Indonesia. Um, uh, so uh, the key to reducing population is successful economic development, development uh, removal of poverty. Uh, through, through the remainder of this century, if nothing changes, if fertility stays as it is now, more than the whole of world population growth will just be in Africa. And that's because African development is failing. Well, it failed last century. It's actually doing a bit better this century. I, I, we have to hope that it, Africa will come out of this pandemic better than it uh, all right, and it's been knocked around badly. But uh, I would confidently expect if uh, we put real effort into uh, e economic development, rising living standards, abolition of poverty in Africa, then the same thing will happen in Africa as happened everywhere else in the world. Fertility will fall, and we just need Africa to get back to replacement levels, and then we've got a world uh, uh, a declining world population. So uh, one has to break up the story into its component parts. Uh, there's, there's no general population problem in the developed world now or in China. Um, in the successful developing countries like India and Indonesia, uh, we're rapidly moving towards a position where it's not a problem. In the countries where poverty is still extreme, uh, we've got a terrible problem to the extent that Nigeria well, is likely, if nothing changes, to have more people than China by the end of this century. On that note, I'd like to invite um, Paddy back up. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. I'd like to echo some of the feedback, or all of the feedback that you've received for your lecture this evening, and say it's really fascinating, incredibly insightful, and I look forward to delving into the topics in more detail in your book. Thank you so much. A really fitting lecture in memory of Fiona. If you could please join me in thanking her again. And uh, if I can just add that uh, your comments about knowledge at the beginning, you know, scientific knowledge and knowledge was um, music to my ears because that's the work of the public library to provide free and, and um, fettered authoritative ac um, sorry, access to authoritative information for everybody. Um, and uh, we'll continue to strive to do that and hopefully investment in public libraries will continue so that we can continue to do that and be the equaliser in society that we are bringing knowledge to everybody. Thank you for, for that. I want to thank the um, Fiona's family for being here this evening. Uh, thank you again um, for coming along. Um, and I want to um, turn now to Lynn from Talkie Books. Thank you for being our literary event partner. And uh, Lynn's here to sell Ross's book. And Ross has kindly agreed to stay behind and sign books. So that's uh, a wonderful thing. So please purchase a book and come and have a chat with uh, Ross afterwards. Many thanks for being here. And I hope to see you again soon. Thank you.